um, and get them from the waiting room into the Zoom chat. I'll go ahead and get started then. Uh, thanks, thanks for joining us. Um, today's talk is going to be on dedicated outside air integration. Uh, looks like we've got a mix of architects and engineers on the line, uh, so I'm excited. We've got a little bit of front matter. Most of you have probably already seen it, so I'll go through it fairly quickly. We are the IDL. Uh, we're a research branch of the University of Idaho's College of Art and Architecture. Uh, we focus on high performance energy efficiency in buildings. We have a full-time staff of three, and then we've got three great graduate students, uh, two of whom recently won a design competition, so that was great. We're looking for another mechanical engineering student to join our team. Uh, so if you know anybody that wants to have graduate school paid for and also get a, a, a stipend, uh, reach out to us. We're, we're looking for good candidates to hire uh, from this spring. This Lunch and Learn is provided to you through Idaho Power, so thank you to them for um, enabling this resource. They also provide uh, funding for technical assistance on uh, design reviews. So if it's uh, phase one to phase two, uh, we can do that for, for free for your client. If it's gonna be a really detailed process, we're gonna be involved kind of all the way from early design uh, through the end and you want some kind of really detailed energy modeling, maybe Asherian 90.1 compliance sort of stuff. Uh, that's, that's when we get into phase three and Idaho Power will cover 75% of that cost, which is great. So then only 25% goes to you. So if you have a project coming up that you would like some assistance with, uh, look on our website. We've got the form uh, or just email uh, one of us directly. We also have a simulation users group that is specifically focused on those that use energy simulations. That's kind of my specialty here at the lab. So I'm gonna be giving one tomorrow uh, on energy modeling specifically for schools. So I've been giving some talks on high performance classrooms and what that looks like from a general standpoint. The talk tomorrow will be specifically focused on energy modeling and looking at some of the um, economics of that here within the state of Idaho. Then uh, if you wanna be involved in next year or you'd like to see different topics or have comments, We've got a roundtable discussion coming up on December 2nd, uh, and that's a chance for you to provide input uh, if you would like to see different topics that would be useful to you or your firm, your team. Um, anyway, so it's a great resource. Uh, we offer CEUs through that, and it's held uh, virtually. Uh, speaking of virtual stuff, we live in the time of COVID, but we still offer uh, no contact pickups uh, and drop offs for our energy resource library. So if you've got a building and you wanna learn more about how it's using energy, submetering, or uh, looking at envelope issues, data logging, uh, we've got close to a thousand different tools that are free for you to use thanks to Idaho Power. So check out Idaho Power's other programs. Uh, they've, they've got uh, some, some really great online programs available to offer incentives for really uh, pursuing energy efficiency projects, uh, whether that's new construction methods or, or others. So uh, don't, don't forget about them uh, when it comes time to apply for some incentive checks and, and get some money for your folks. All right, so on, on to the good stuff. So today is talking about DOS integration. Uh, I'm really kind of focusing this specifically on high efficiency heat exchangers and how that really impacts the design. So I, uh, despite my receding hairline, I haven't been out in the field, you know, all that long. Uh, I'm, I'm young, so I can't offer you like, okay, here's what it actually looks like in a design firm. Uh, and I don't want to pretend to. What I do hope to offer you today is basically, I've spent a lot of time reading. It's my job to research and, and look at new and emerging technologies and see what makes sense uh, from a financial and energy efficiency standpoint for local projects. I'm gonna be relying pretty heavily on three main reports. Um, I would say one of the best resources is this um, ASHRAE design guide for dedicated outdoor air systems. Uh, great information on controls, different layout options. I've read through it a couple of times. 
it's surprisingly well written um, and engaging. Uh, even if you're just an architect um, and want to just browse through it, uh, it's available as part of our energy resource library. If you want to check it out, um, we can um, lend this copy out to you. I've, I've gotten a lot of, of great things from it. Uh, we've also got um, ASHRAE 62.1. Because uh, you know we, we need to focus our duct sizing based on ventilation, and this is the ventilation guide. The other two resources uh, I don't have print copies of, but they are available for free online, which is great. Uh, and it's really the work that uh, Nia has done on this, um, specifically uh, their their design guide, their very high efficiency dedicated outdoor air system comprehensive design guide. Uh, that came out uh, just this September. Uh, there have been many reports leading up to it, including some economic analysis, uh, and then a report that came out in March. There are case studies. Please check out betterbricks.com. You'll see their graphics displayed uh, throughout this. I'm really um, leaning on them for a lot of that information and hopefully will provide um, you know, a, a synthesized analysis hitting some of the, the high points and some of the technical features. But if you want to dive deeper into it about like say humidity control or uh, things of that nature, uh, please check out that library um, and, and that online resource. I should also mention, uh, feel free to unmute yourself during this presentation. I am really terrible at looking at the chat window. I will look at it at the end of the presentation. I'll try to leave 10 or so minutes at the end, uh, just open discussion time. But the idea is that this is an educational resource for you and I don't, it's hard for me to get feedback talking to a uh, computer camera and screen. So please unmute yourself at any point if you do have a question and interrupt me. I won't consider it an interruption. I will consider it engagement and would really like to focus on uh, specific questions that, that you might have or, or comments uh, if you've been kind of working on these systems. I do wanna emphasize kind of from the very beginning that dedicated outside air systems, even um, DOS plus or VHE, very high efficiency DOS, it's not just a piece of technology. It's not just, okay, we have this building, uh, let's slap on this heat exchanger and call it good. It's really a, a systems-based approach. You can use lots of different technologies, uh, different layouts that are gonna be unique to that site. So it's very flexible, but it takes thinking kind of from the ground up. And I think we as engineers and architects really need to step up and not necessarily think of HVAC as that thing that comes at the end of design. Uh, okay, you've got so much plenum space, good luck engineers, fit it in, make sure that people are happy. Uh, instead, you know, the, the, the projects that I think would, would be the most satisfying would be those where the client is really excited, uh, really comfortable, really um, just, just happy with the design so you're not like worrying twiddling your thumbs like am i going to get a call back uh when the system breaks right people really notice hvac when it doesn't work well there are far fewer compliments that are given when it is working well which is i think unfortunate uh, so i think it's our job to really when we're talking about these high performance design options uh Talk about the, the benefits to the clients, things that they will hopefully have their eyes open to, uh, whether that's better ventilation, reduced noise, more comfort, um, in, or, you know, mention to them uh, ways to avoid all, all the things that we just, uh, the opposites of what I just mentioned, discomfort, loud fans, um, people that are just really unhappy in their offices, or weird smells that just stay in the building and never get removed, right? We don't want those. So let's talk about like a, a system-wide approach to a, a highly functioning HVAC system. And, and I think DOS is, is really a, a great way to move forward on that. And what it is, is it, it just decouples your ventilation from your heating and cooling. So instead of 
bring all your air in through your rooftop unit or your main air handler and just blasting a whole bunch of conditioned air into the space. Instead, we're only bringing in ventilation air and then separately, we're gonna use small terminal units within the space to then condition that space to warm it up or cool it down. But that's gonna be a different system than what's actually delivering the air that we need to breathe. So there's a few advantages to this. Uh, one is we can really control that ventilation so we get improved air quality. Number two is savings, um, energy, as, as well as potentially economic. There's a lot of flexibility in design and reduced noise, which I don't think it's enough credit. So we, I, I'm, I'm giving this lunch and learn virtually because it's, it's COVID season, unfortunately, uh, in Idaho and across the country. Uh, there's some great ASHRAE resources providing guidance for building operations during this pandemic. And increasing outdoor air is, is one of the primary ones. And I think designing a dedicated outdoor air system can you know, it can protect against COVID-19 because we're, we're doing less recirculation of air, which is exhausting all that dirty air that I'm currently breathing out. And sorry to the rest of IDL folks that eventually might have to rebreathe some of this stuff. Uh, but it's also, let's think about it in terms of future proofing, um, not to use like scare tactics, but what about like COVID-35, you know, the next coronavirus? hopefully not as bad as this one, but maybe it's a particularly bad seasonal flu. Maybe COVID-19 stays with us and it's just a secondary flu cycle. We've all heard about sick building syndrome. Uh, it's, it's particularly relevant now. And that was the idea that, you know, germs spread within an office and we're just, you know, recirculating some of those germs. I think dedicated outdoor air systems are one way to kind of future proof against that. Um, if another pandemic kind of comes along by providing better indoor air quality. So in terms of like some of the recommendations coming out of ASHRAE right now, it's really coming down to um, increasing the outdoor air ventilation, limiting recirculation, and then keeping those systems running longer, right? Just dilute as much as possible all the spittle and aerosols that are coming out of our mouths that might potentially affect others. But it's more than just germs that recirculate, right? It's also VOCs, volatile organic compounds coming off of new carpets, paint, the like. Uh, even CO2 levels, especially relevant in say conference rooms where everybody starts to get drowsy at about the same time. Maybe that's just the poor speaker, but it might also be because we're all breathing each other's CO2 and that triggers our body to go into a different metabolic state. We respond to that physiologically and our breathing patterns change and we start yawning whether or not we have enough oxygen in the room, right? CO2 is um, really what our body uses to, to kind of trigger some of those responses. Using a dedicated outdoor air system, we're, we're not necessarily, we're not recirculating that, right? We're trying to remove that as that's happening, as well as odors. Uh, done a few different audits uh, this last year uh, involving police stations who had very smelly contraband. Um, and it, it made it seem like it was a very chill office to work in uh, because those odors were getting kind of swapped around the space uh, because so much circulation, uh, recirculation was happening. This wasn't just one station, this was a couple of different um, places. Maybe you're not locking up very smelly non-tobacco products, uh, but there might be, you know, a, a trash area or some printer room or something like that that's causing odors within the office. You know, let's let's dedicate that um, that outside air to always be fresh and not recirculate. So the difference, just layout-wise, as a conventional rooftop unit or air handling unit. We've got kind of return air. We mix it with that incoming outdoor air so that it's um, an easier temperature to condition than use a fan to bring it the rest of the way through. Whereas with the dedicated outdoor air system, there's no mixing. We just exhaust all of that and then bring in 100% fresh air. What we can do is recycle some of the heat and uh, I'll be talking about that in more detail later. And ventilation, you know, it, not just in terms of smells and, and CO2, but it, it really has a 
physical impact on occupants. I think it's something that engineers and architects should really mention to their clients that if you have good ventilation in the building, whether you're doing a retrofit or, or you're looking kind of from the ground up, um, especially for, for schools, um, you know, these statistics are coming in pre-COVID studies, uh, but you can really decrease absences from illness by improving ventilation, um, just from your common cold and flu. Improve decision-making because your um, brain is taking in kind of fresh air and not worried about, oh, all that other CO2, so I need to start shutting down some of my processes. So your employees are gonna be more productive or students uh, or, you know, whoever is gonna be in your building. All right, so that's kind of, I think, a primary motivating factor that we're pretty familiar with. Now I wanna dive into some more kind of technical details because people are like, all right, DOS is great, sounds good, but how expensive is it gonna be? Uh, and even, even the term very high efficiency, dedicated outdoor air system or, or BHE, um, people hear that and they think, okay, BHE, that very high efficiency, that means very high first cost, very expensive. Um, and there is a premium. And sometimes I worry that people are trying to sell these systems without really diving deep into the details. Here at IDL, University of Idaho, I'm not trying to sell you a particular technology. I am trying to sell energy savings. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's our main goal here, but also high performance spaces. I do think that it is possible to save clients a million dollars using a dedicated outdoor air system, just looking at the numbers. Um, so let's, let's kind of dive into that. If you look at the capital cost of a BHE dedicated outdoor air system, it's coming in at about $23 per square foot. Now that is a premium over a baseline rooftop unit heat pump, um, which would be closer to say $19 per square foot. Where I'm pulling these numbers is from uh, Red Car Analytics. Uh, they did kind of an economic analysis of multiple scenarios of HVAC. This came out in 2019. It was a report for NIA. It's available online. They have case studies. You can uh, look much more deeply uh, into their methodology if, if you want. Uh, as I think engineers, where we're naturally skeptics, I as an academic am. And uh, so I just want you to know where those numbers are coming from. Uh, I, I find them to be um, pretty compelling, especially their, their annual energy savings coming directly from case studies um, rather than just a master's thesis looking at uh, energy plus models. As much as I love energy plus models, I love seeing real numbers. And what they found was an annual energy savings over a rooftop unit of 30 to 40 percent. Not HVAC savings, total building wide energy savings of 30 to 40 percent. The actual HVAC savings were in the 70 percent range. So they were vastly reducing their HVAC consumption. And that total building energy savings of 30 to 40 percent ended up coming in uh, with some pretty decent payback periods. So I looked at their numbers, Red Car Analytics. I, I changed some of them uh, to try and make it a little more specific to Boise. Red Car Analytics, they, they used a 10 cent uh, per kilowatt hour cost. I, and they also assumed a 3.5, um escalation rate. I, I assumed an energy cost that was a little bit lower, closer to what we see here in Idaho, uh, whether you're looking at the Vista or Idaho Power of seven and a half cents per kilowatt hour. And I assumed uh, no, no rate escalation uh, relative to inflation. I just looked at USDA's inflation projections um, that were available. So about 2.2%. Uh, for a 45,000 square foot office in Boise, climate zone 5B, uh, the energy savings looked to be about 43 cents per square foot. All right, so let's look at, okay, how much extra did we have to invest in this, that 20% first cost premium versus lifetime savings? These systems will last about 20 years. And what I wanted to do is look at the, the present value savings. 
uh, so accounting for inflation. And you can see that year zero at install, we're, we're spending uh, a fair amount extra over um, our baseline unit. But over time, the savings really add up. And then you, if you look at the cumulative savings uh, over, over the lifetime of that equipment, just looking at energy savings, not looking at maintenance savings, not looking at other qualitative improvements that are happening within the space, it was a present value of over a million dollars. All right, so maybe you have a tenant that this isn't gonna be a compelling case for. They're just gonna rent it out to tenants who are fine with bad odors and flus recirculating. Uh, not that a baseline system has to do that, but it can. Um, and, you know, they're somebody else's problem to pay the bills, right? Well, that, that may be the case for some, but certainly not all. Certainly educational facilities, um, municipalities, uh, even hospitals, they're in it for, for the long term, and they're going to be the ones occupying that building and paying the bills, which is why I think you see so many VRF systems and, and dedicated outside air systems going into those types of buildings. It doesn't just have to be a, a new building, though. It, it's also relevant for retrofits. And there have been some really great case studies that Nia has done recently uh, on basically taking a conventional building uh, of a uh, with a traditional rooftop unit and then changing, changing it around to function as a very highly efficient dedicated outside air system, adding a high efficiency heat exchanger. And so what this bar chart shows is EUI, energy use index, your, your annual KBTU per square foot. Um, the base load is here in this pinkish purple, uh, and that's plug loads, that's building operations, that, those are things you can't necessarily change. What we're talking about here is just what can you change HVAC-wise. So pre-conversion, this is what they were using, uh, versus a code minimum, just bringing that HVAC system up to code is this light blue here versus what is white here, and that is post-conversion measured EUI for this high efficient dedicated outside air system. Uh, and there's just this, this vast difference here. And so they were, they were limiting their HVAC EUIs to between you know, uh, eight, eight or so, um, let's see, yeah, eight being some of the lowest ones, um, up to say 15, uh, this utility district office had higher ventilation requirements. So there was a uh, higher EUI here, but in a lot of the other spaces, they were really reducing their, their EUIs. And if you start stacking this on top of the base load, what you find is that for a single story building, you're within the net zero range. So if you have a client that's looking at a retrofit and they're gung ho about green or um, you know, trying to get, say, off grid, maybe not financially reasonable to do so right now. Um, but we're, we're getting close by using this technology, by limiting our heating and cooling loads so much uh, that for single story offices, we're now kind of in the realm of what's feasible uh, to offset just with solar panels on the roof. Not necessarily true for multi-story buildings, but um, I think a compelling case to, to make for those that are really uh, trying to go that direction. The other thing is it's starting to just become required by code. Uh, 2017, the Washington Energy State Code uh, requires energy recovery and dedicated outside air systems for offices, education, uh, retail buildings, libraries, and fire stations. This isn't necessarily requiring super highly efficient DOS, but it is requiring DOS for those spaces. And I'm curious to see how many other codes in our region follow this example. Um, I'm kind of looking in California to see if they're going to be the next one. All right, like I said, it's a, it's a system, not just one technology. Uh, so the nice thing is that it makes it very flexible. So some equipment that you can use with dedicated outside air system, how can you really integrate this ground up in your building? VRFs are the 
popular choice right now, far and away. Um, you can also look at other air source heat pumps, you know, even like a, a mini split system for those much smaller office areas. You can look at ground source heat pumps. These are very efficient. Uh, and we've got grad student studies uh, that have looked from um, Oak Ridge and Berkeley that show return on investment, but it does come with a pretty high capital cost that given our low electricity prices in the Northwest can make it harder, but not impossible to uh, rule out. You can also use a hydronic system, whether that's a radiant slab for heating or a four pipe fan coil. NIA really encourages linking those with a heat pump plant system. So you're still getting that coefficient of performance that's pretty high, as opposed to just using, uh, say, an electric boiler. Um, not that anyone would here. Um, you know, gas is still pretty cheap, um, but there's certainly a movement on towards electrification in certain buildings. And so a hydronic system with a heat pump plant can, can also work with this technology. And that means that there's kind of a, a lot of different indoor units that you can apply. Uh, you know, so don't just look at the full catalog of what you know your your train Mitsubishi or your um, Fujitsu is is offering uh, to to really um, have within the site itself. What what sort of terminal units? Whether you want that to um, be recessed within the ceiling uh, and have kind of a low impact there, or if you really want to take advantage of um, you know not necessarily having a plenum space um, because, or a much smaller plenum space than using you know, these, these wall-mounted cassettes or beneath windows. The other important piece to link with this is heat exchanger. Uh, not always required by, uh, well, Washington's code now kind of requires this. Um, in Idaho, it really depends on uh, the 2018 IECC. If you look at that table 403.5, um, feel free to, to dive into that if you want. If it's running basically all the time, uh, more than 8,000 hours per year, and it's more than 80 CFM being delivered by the pen, then you're required to have some sort of heat exchange. Uh, there's a lot of different types of heat exchangers. Uh, and if it's using it less than 8,000 hours a year, I think I think you can get away with it, but I'd have to look at the code more closely again. There's a, there's a bunch of different kinds of heat exchangers though, and the efficiency of that exchanger is really gonna vary based on the type of flow. So if you've got two airstreams going parallel to each other, the max thermodynamically that can be exchanged according to um, Mechanical Engineering Reference Manual, MERM, uh, is 50%. When you're starting at that cross flow, uh, so perpendicular streams of airflow, uh, they can get into the 50 to 70% range. If you're doing multiple passes, you can get up to 85%, but it's really that, that counter flow that's giving you your max effectiveness. It's, it's also important to look at when you're trying to specify your heat exchanger the testing protocols that are used. Um, most are, are done by um, you know, 1060 or, or 90.1, and the winter outdoor conditions are chilly, 35, versus an indoor condition of 67. Um, those are the two different airstreams that are gonna be passing by each other. And when you look at a certain percentage of, of efficacy, it's gonna be at these conditions and at a certain flow. In Boise, uh, it gets a little bit colder than 35. So uh, there has to be a little bit more work on the engineer's part to make sure that your equipment is going to uh, you know, meet your you know, 1% or 99% design conditions. So for uh, testing for you know, standard um, summer hours, uh, that's much closer to uh, Boise's conditions. I think 95 is our 1% condition and 98 is our 0.4% condition if you're looking at um, ASHRAE's latest design um, climate, climate design days. 
the efficiency on these heat exchangers also isn't just constant. It's going to vary inversely and non-linearly with flow. It's going to uh, get worse as you shove more air through it. It's also going to depend on whether it's in cooling or heating mode. Uh, so this graphic is coming from Ventacity, which uh, has a line of heat exchangers. But if you look at, say, Swigon or, or others, um, look, look for these graphs and make sure that your equipment is, is going to be um, functioning correctly at, at your design conditions without necessarily overdoing these huge safety factors, right? Because um, that's really where this, the, the savings are, are going to come in is from trying to minimize your flows and, and minimize your equipment sizes. So NIA has developed uh, kind of a set of standards for what they consider to be a high efficient heat exchanger. And that's a uh, sensible recovery of 85% at the midpoint of nominal flow or 82% um, at 75% at of flow. It has to have economizing capabilities. I believe this is also a requirement in 2018 IACC, although IACC codes let you get away with an ERB of say 50 to 60 percent, uh, you know, much lower efficiency than what you're getting out of uh, technologies like this. NIA also um, has requirements on the amount of crossbow flow leakage as well as their fan efficacy. Um, fans are kind of the silent or not so silent killers of energy efficiency that are always going um, in, in at least like a, a multifamily application. Um, but they're, they're running a lot. And if you have an inefficient fan or you're trying to overcome a super high static pressure, uh, then you're, you're not gonna be realizing the energy savings and the payback period that you really want from the system. Uh, they should also come with control capabilities, um, you know, multi-zoning, scheduling, occupancy, et cetera. I was surprised reading through their design guide that they actually don't encourage um, heat exchangers for VRFs. Uh, they, they, because that's also going to come with an added premium. Instead, uh, they, they want um, more of just a, a standard VRF without the heat exchange option in there um, and just really fine, fine tuning your, your zoning and um, climate, climate analysis to make sure that all spaces can be within um, heating or off or cooling or off modes instead of just swapping heat from one side to the other. Uh, the other certification that you can look for is Passive House. Um, Passive House Institute PHI they will also put their stamp of approval on heat exchangers that meet many of these same criteria. So look for either NIA's uh, qualified product list or PHI if you're really designing for this high efficiency heat exchanger. So those are some numbers. I, I think it's important to also provide some just visuals. Uh, so I'm, I'm straight up stealing here from a few slides from NIA on some of the case studies that they did in the last few years. Uh, these are available on betterbricks.com, so please check those out there. Uh, I believe uh, Charlie Stevens was, was running this or, or helped on this report. So the first one is a law office. So looking at numbers, it's 12,000 square foot space, um, roof of R20, exterior walls of R8, and windows of R3. Not super high performing envelope. Of course, it's the climate zone 4C. It's a little bit milder than what we have here in Boise. Uh, but you can see uh, their, their pre conversion EUI, not terrible, EUI of 53, dropped down to an uh, in, in EUI of 18.9. Um, so this was 65% measured energy savings for the whole building based on their energy bills. Um, and that, that um, uh, the return on investment for this space, I think if you're looking at simple payback period was about eight years. Um, the example that I gave earlier, I think the simple ROI was about seven years. Uh, so uh, this is a, a range of different retrofits that they did. Um, 
these were the buildings ranging as found from 80 to 160 EUI post conversion in the 20 to 40 range. Uh, so really uh, dropping that down. And that's that's measure, measured demonstrated savings um, for, for the whole building. So um, pretty, pretty compelling findings. It did come with the premium and these are, are retrofits, um, but pretty significant energy savings and an ROI of eight years. In this case, that was assuming a 10 cent per kilowatt hour charge. And just visually speaking, here's what the old system looked like, the old air handler replaced with the high efficiency heat exchanger. This is the new ventilation system. So really saving on a lot of rooftop space. Another visual, uh, there was a, a gut remodel at some dormitories at UC Davis. And uh, this was the rooftop equipment that existed before. Um, look at all the different roof penetrations that were happening here. And after conversion, uh, they were able to convert some of those old, um, you know, ducts through the roof into a uh, skylight for some, some natural light in the space, I'm sure making students happier um, and, and limiting kind of the rooftop chaos that had been there before. Uh, so some, something else to consider, say, from um, you know, building or, or, or civic codes, uh, if you're wondering about stacking a giant cooling tower or chiller on top of the building, uh, by using one of these systems, you're really minimizing uh, the, the equipment uh, size. And the reason it's so much smaller is because we're not using air to condition the space anymore, right? Uh, we downsize our ductwork to just be for ventilation um, instead of using lots of hot air, which is the natural insulator. Uh, not very efficient at conveying heat. Instead, we're going to use uh, refrigerant lines, uh, which is kind of much smaller in terms of piping. Uh, downside is, you know, Bruce Willis can't climb through your vents. Uh, you know, it is nearing Christmas season, so I need to start watching Die Hard again. Uh, but, you know, maybe that's a positive thing. Uh, I think even in the latest um, Stranger Things, kids were crawling through ducts. Um, not that kids should be crawling through ducts or, you know, but, you know, raccoons, mice, let's just limit their, their area. They can find other places to scurry. And this is gonna really limit our floor, um, the, the plenum requirements and, and floor to ceiling. And where that I think is often missed in terms of savings is looking from a design standpoint, if, if you no longer have to design for this extra plenum space, that doesn't just mean that your floor to ceiling is, is going to get a little bit higher or maybe you have, um, it, it means if you're at the very beginning of the design process, the building itself can be a little bit shorter. So imagine all the savings that can come from that extra six to 12 inches of height, all that extra masonry, the extra height on the windows or spandrels, whatever have you, um, that is going to be a major uh, savings. Uh, so, but it's, it's not something that, you know, applies to a retrofit. And it's not something we often think of early on, but especially if you're doing multi-story buildings, the more you stack that, the, the more the savings really add up from a height perspective by using a dedicated outside air system and this smaller, um, you know, smaller venting. All right, so how does this affect design? Uh, this is gonna be kind of more specifically for the engineers right now. Uh, Looking back at our good old psychrometric charts, uh, a Seattle winter. So design conditions for Seattle winter, what I was looking at on, on Asher was say it might be 25 degrees out. Indoors, we want it to be 72. And I'm just looking at sensible efficiency here, uh, not, not latent. Uh, there's, there's more to be said on that, but I probably won't go into it in this presentation. But if you look at a code baseline heat exchanger, that's gonna get you 50% of the way there. And so the air that you're gonna be bringing in is 
uh, 48 degrees Fahrenheit. Not super pleasant. Uh, so you're gonna need to add some extra heating on that to make sure you don't have the, those drafts within the building. But if you have an HRV that's in that 85% range, then all of a sudden your air that's gonna be coming in is at 65 degrees for, for ventilation. That might be within the window to not necessarily need any extra supplemental heating equipment on that indoor air take, uh, on that intake of outdoor air, rather. So that's gonna minimize control costs, that's gonna minimize equipment costs, um, save, save folks a, a lot of um, headaches that way. Uh, you know, Seattle, you might be playing it a little bit close, but, but look at your design conditions, look at um, realistically what's gonna be uh, your design conditions, not just stacking on all those coincidental loads um, and considering the absolute worst scenario, but the, the reasonable coldest scenario. Uh, I was browsing today and you can actually see as Urban Heat Island <laughs> takes effect, um, from 2009 to 2016, the ASHRAE climate data has upped by a degree or two, so make sure you're using the, the latest, because um, that might take you within a few degrees of your indoor air, uh, and that means you no longer need that supplemental heating. What about cooling? Uh, Seattle summers, uh, if you're looking at a code baseline system, that's only gonna get you to say 80 degrees, that might be too warm um, to bring in directly. Whereas if you're looking at 85% efficiency, uh, that's gonna get you to within a few degrees of your indoor conditions, uh, which it's okay to, to bring in at that point. Uh, I apologize if this graphic's a little bit pressed, uh, but I think you should be able to get that idea. All right, in terms of Boise, um, summers are, are great. So I was looking here at about a, a 98 degree outdoor day. Uh, a HRV of 50% is gonna get us close, but not quite, whereas a 85% efficiency is gonna get us to within a few degrees of where we want our indoor air drive old condition to be. So that could be helpful. Boise winter though, might be a different story. So looking at 10 degrees outdoor air, a 50% efficient HRV is gonna get our uh, intake of outdoor air close to 40 degrees. Helpful, but not great. Uh, an 85% efficient is going to get us to 60 degrees. And that's nice. That's within 10 to 12 degrees of our indoor conditions, but that's still too much of a delta T. If somebody might be sitting underneath that um, ventilation diffuser, and it's going to feel pretty not nice for them, give them some goosebumps. So we are going to need a little bit of supplemental heating on this not necessarily needing supplemental cooling on the summer side, so that limits the equipment that we have to put in. Um, and we don't need supplemental heating all the time, but just when our outdoor air conditions drop within uh, to below a certain level. So this graphic is coming directly from ASHRAE's design guide, so this is not looking at high efficient HRVs, it's looking at standard efficiency. Uh, so, some of these numbers might need to shift a little bit, but it's trying to convey just a, uh, a control strategy that you can use, uh, which is as your outdoor dry bulb temperature decreases, um, add small amounts of supplemental heating to that airstream so that the coldest outdoor air that you're bringing into the space is gonna be 67 degrees. All right, so, um, some other design considerations. Uh, you know, account for humidity. Uh, in, in Boise, it's so dry here, we don't necessarily, you know, a, a lot of this design guide is really focused on removing humidity. We don't necessarily want to do that in Boise. Um, we wanna make sure we're not drying people out completely. Uh, so look at the, the difference between an HRV and an ERV and what supplemental measures you might need to add to make sure that the space is um, conditioned appropriately. We've also seen how humidity affects the transmission of COVID and bacteria and aerosols. So um, really try to keep your indoor space within that 30%. Controls are also key. 
it's easy to install an expensive system that doesn't work. Um, the, it needs to be kind of from the ground up, going into client education, um, making sure that they are taking on ownership of the system and that it is functioning well so that supplemental heat does kick on and you're not just dropping cold air on folks. Uh, so, so managing where that airflow is going. And these systems are great in a lot of commercial settings, but not every single one. If it's gonna be you know, really large volume space, um, concert hall, gym, probably not an ideal solution, um, not, not for high flow areas. Because as I mentioned, you know, your, your efficiency really goes down as the flow increases. And um, uh, the, the max CFM for some of these units uh, that are considered highly efficient that come with that qualifier is around 5,000 CFM. As of March, it was 3,000. So more and more products are coming onto the market that are meeting this. Uh, but it's, it can be a limiting factor. So look at your outdoor air requirements, your ventilation requirements, um, and, and make sure that you're, you have the appropriate number of these units for your space. The other thing that I found very fascinating uh, from the, the economic analysis was that the high efficiency DOS cost less than a low tier DOS. Uh, and that primarily came from reducing equipment sizes. So here is, I'm afraid it's a bit fuzzy, uh, but here's the RTU heat pump baseline initial costs broken out by component. And then the low tier DOS, so your code minimum, uh, your, your HRV that's only 50% efficient is costing significantly more than a high efficiency DOS. And the reason is reduced VRF equipment sizes and also reduced um, supplemental heating, this little red strike here. And that's gonna add up over time and really make a, a compelling economic argument. Uh, I, I think it's really important to kind of look long-term at this and take a hard look at it uh, and not just be kind of sold on the, the theory of it um, but really run your own numbers and make sure that it is you know, for the client. The other numbers to consider when you're looking at economics is filter and fan costs. Uh, so uh, this is coming again from the dedicated outside air guide from ASHRAE and a VAV versus a DOS. Um, as the, the filter efficiencies get higher and now we're looking at you know, MERV 13 to really block from uh, COVID, but also consider smoke in the Pacific Northwest, you know, a major issue. Uh, the filter costs of a dedicated outside air system are, are much lower um, over time than a VAV because the area, the face area of that filter is going to be so much smaller because we're not bringing in all this air to condition, we're just bringing in air for breathing. Um, there is a trade-off now because you've got terminal units inside. Those need individual filter changes. So um, that, that can has, have some trade-offs because there's more maintenance to do inside. That's pretty easy, but a whole lot less maintenance that you need to do outside on um, you know, the compressor side of things, which might take a, a certified building operator. All right, so final thoughts, and then we can kind of turn it over to, to questions. But it's really up to you guys, architects and engineers, to tell clients that dedicated outside air systems are an option uh, and to consider it from the beginning rather than just throwing it in at the end. If you, throw, if you consider it from the beginning and then you create a high performance envelope with little infiltration, then your loads are gonna be so much smaller uh, that it's uh, going to become cost-effective Whereas if you just slap on, oh, an HRV standard, um, sure, that'll work. It's actually gonna come with higher costs. So it's really that integrated design approach, looking at high efficiency equipment so you can downsize your loads. Um, that, that's really gonna make this worth doing. There's also a lot of other qualitative improvements. So it goes beyond just money and you know, my, my capitalist approach. Uh, health. It kind of goes without saying during COVID right now, 
but improving indoor air quality, really important to clients right now. Also, smell. Uh, I, I made some jokes about some police stations with some issues, uh, but also went to a presentation and heard from uh, an engineer who had done a check-in on an, an, a long-term care facility. And she said one of the greatest things uh, about that site was when people went in, uh, it didn't have that kind of smell that comes from folks in long-term health, long-term care. Um, that can also be the case in, um, you know, health um, environments and, you know, multifamily units where there's just a lot of people packed in. Uh, these are going to just exhaust those bioepilins uh, and instead just bring in fresh air. The other thing is noise. Uh, because you're using uh, smaller fans and less pressure, uh, you won't have to be shouting over the hiss of the HVAC system. I'm standing in a room right now, it's about 45 to 50 decibels. It drives me a, a tiny bit crazy. Uh, if you want me to really go off on that tomorrow, um, you can join me for the BSUG where I'll be talking about noise in classrooms and how to quantify that uh, and the effect that might have on students. Uh, but it's one of those things that we kind of put up with right now, maybe like we used to put up with low ceilings and flickering yellow fluorescent lights. But I think HVAC noise is um, going to be outdated and we should really think about future-proofing our buildings so that when people walk into a space, it's pleasant and they're not worried about these cold drafts and high fan velocities and that hiss in the background or some weird smells. Uh, instead, it's going to be quiet and comfortable and smell fresh. Uh, and that all comes from proper integration of a dedicated outside air system with high efficiency heat exchange. So that's what I've got for you today. Um, right? I appreciate your time. Uh, Dylan, I think we'll launch a poll now uh, so you can give me feedback on um, this topic and other topics that you'd like to hear from IDL uh, this next year. Uh, big shout out to Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance and all the work that they have done on this, um, on whose work I relied so heavily today. Uh, I'll stop talking. Uh, it can be a little bit awkward on Zoom because I can't make eye contact or, or hear folks necessarily until you unmute, but feel free to do so. Um, I'll take some sips of water and check the chat window. So thank you. All right, I'll leave it open for another minute or two. Damon, you have a question and it's from Margie Kennedy. Which system lasts the longest? Ah, thanks for bringing that to my attention, uh, Ken. Um, that is a Great question. I don't have a, uh, which system requires, last longest and requires the least amount of maintenance. Are you talking specifically regarding the, uh, within the DOS world, uh, four pipe fan foil or BRF versus, um, you know, a heat pump system uh, between a DOS and an RTU? Um, so I think it, it will depend, it's, it's a mix um, and, I, and I don't wanna to speak too far outside of my own area of expertise. Um, what, what I've read, I can share with you that 
the maintenance on the compressor uh, is definitely minimized using uh, a VRF system or a heat pump system. You know, it's, it's a smaller unit up on the roof uh, that, that doesn't require kind of as, as much care. Um, you're, you're also kind of centralizing your, your outdoor air intake. So that's one filter that you need to change less often. Uh, the, the lifespan of these systems is 20 years. Uh, RTUs, I think, uh, are also designed for that. Um, you will see many much older ones in disrepair around um, that I don't necessarily think are, you know, if you were to check on, on their code compliance, they'd, they'd be a, a bit um, out of it. Uh, but the analysis is, is looking at a 20 year payback period and the maintenance is less specialized, um, but it can increase depending on the number of filters that you need to change. Generally, VRFs are sold on being lower maintenance overall, but there are trade-offs. So it's, it's a gray-ish area. Um, and if you're curious, I can send more more literature your way um, kind of where, where I'm getting those feelings um, based on, on studies. Um, it's certainly less maintenance than say a uh, BAV plant system where you need specialized chiller and, and boiler maintenance and, and the like. Um, instead you're dealing with smaller um, compressor and boiler units that can be helpful. RTUs are a little bit different. All right, one last call for questions. Okay, well, thanks all for joining me. I hope you have a good uh, Tuesday and uh, very happy Thanksgiving. Uh, if you're curious on more of these Lunch and Learns, just